Do do dee. It's Nandi. Hello friends. This is a video that I've postponed a few times now because of other content. So it's a relief to finally get back to it because it's another collaboration with Tawan. These videos are always pretty well received because of the analytical nature that Tawan brings to the table. And I'll try and distill all of this into simple and easy to apply knowledge. I've also got a character giveaway for this video. To fit the theme of equipment, it will be a double defensive item Tyrant Guard giveaway. Currently, the Tyrant Guard is unfarmable and is a legendary event all-star. Stick around to the end to find out more about the giveaway. It's timestamped, so if you're just here for the giveaway, feel free to skip ahead. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about equipment today. Specifically, the best equipment for characters and some detailed analysis about how all of this factors into your gameplay decisions and resource spending. As a preamble, we can set the stage for why this is all so important. At the crux of it, equipment is intrinsically tied into how your character performs in all game modes. There is nuance, and some equipment is simply better than others. Particularly in the early game, equipment can make a big difference to how you progress. This falls away later on in the game and is possibly something for Snowprint to address, but I'll explain why and how later on. Every character has three equipment slots. The first is always a weapon that gives critical chance. This can range from 20 to 40% depending on the weapon. The second slot is always a defensive slot. Depending on the character, this can be a block item that gives you a block chance or a stat item that increases health or armor. The third slot is a booster. Again, character dependent, this either increases your block chance or critical hit chance by up to 5%. Using weapons as an example, we know that the higher critical hit chances do lower critical hit damage. Conversely, if you have a higher damage number for those weapons, they have a lower critical hit chance. On the face of it, if you look at the formulae on the bottom of this slide, everything looks like it all evens out. However, things are much more complex than they look on the surface. Critical damage is a concept that has been part of gaming for as long as I can remember. If any of you have ever played Warcraft 3, you'll remember how much fun it was trying to get the perfect items to get huge critical hit numbers on your Orc Blademaster. Things work differently in Tacticus. In this game, rather than being an overall damage multiplier, critical damage is best thought of as a damage buff, similar to things like Kalgar's passive. Indeed, on screen you can see how a level 11 gun does about 1000 damage if a critical hit is achieved, and this is added to each hit in the same way that Kalgar's passive would. Things get more interesting when we start looking at hit chains. Hopefully by now you'll know that every single character attack in the game has a number of hits. Some have a single hit, and others can go up to 7 hits with their attack. Critical hits follow a mathematical principle that has been explained to me as a Markov chain. You'll see this explained in the diagram on screen. For a 3 hit character, we follow this pathway. If the first hit in an attack is not a crit, you stop the chain and no further crits can be achieved on that attack. If the hit is a crit, then you get to roll your crit chance for the second hit. You keep going in this way until you fail to achieve a crit. In theory, you could crit on all of your hits, but you need the previous hit to be a critical in order to keep the chain going. Now, let's put this into practice using Bellator, a 6-hit Imperial character. Nimak is the guild leader of the Thousand Suns Guild in our Eye of Terror cluster. He has kindly put this table together for you. I'll walk you through it, but it's fairly intuitive. On the left-hand side of this table, you can see the expected damage for any item in the game without an Ethana buff. Starting on the left, you have the dagger with a 20% crit chance, and then the gun with a 35% crit chance, and then the sort of special knife with a 25% crit chance. Dagger plus, gun plus, and knife plus denote the damage if the character has a crit booster to increase their crit chance by a further 5%. The right-hand side of the table denotes the same equipment, but all the crit chances are increased by 20% due to Ethana's passive. The column on the far left tells you how many hits the character has. We can put this into practice using Bellator. Bellator is a 6-hit character. In isolation, for a 6-hit character, you're going to get the most damage from a gun. In fact, based on this table, the gun is the best weapon to equip for all characters, provided Athana is not part of the equation. Now let's look at a scenario where we can only use one character to buff Bellator. Let's see how Kalgar compares to Athana. Kalgar has a passive that buffs 1300 damage per hit for Imperial characters. Bellator has a damage stat of 764, so we try the formula seen on screen. 6 times 764 plus 1296 plus 900, for a total of 12720 damage. Obviously this doesn't take into account enemy armor, but let's ignore that just for the purposes of theorycrafting just now. 
Before we move on, it's important to highlight here just how minuscule the crit buff is compared to everything else. Kalgar is giving Bellator a total bonus of 7,800 damage through his passive. A max gun only gives 900 bonus damage on an expected critical damage roll, over 8 times less than Kalgar. Ethana's buff gives Bellator a bonus of 400 damage per hit and also increases the critical hit chance. Great, except that critical hits scale poorly at the end of the game, and that bonus 900 we had from earlier is now 1900. The total from this formula comes out to roughly 8400, significantly less than Kalgar despite us increasing the critical hit chance. Clearly, we're operating here purely in the realms of theory crafting, but the takeaway is that critical damage really falls off as your character progresses and compares to other character passives. Having said that, there are some corner cases or exceptions. The Adeptus Sororitas have a faction passive called Act of Faith. This allows them to increase their critical hit chance and damage. Here, knives work best for the maximum damage boost. Calandus is another exception. Two weapons and the fact that she is generally used in PvP means that you want to maximize your critical hit chance for the chance to roll a crit and potentially one-shot enemies in modes like Tournament Arena. The takeaway from weapons is twofold. Critical hits are simply best thought of as a buff. They are most useful when you don't have other sources of damage buff and certainly fade away as you progress through the game. I certainly wouldn't advocate for spending lots of resources on upgrading weapons in the current landscape of how this mechanic functions. Phew, okay that was long and detailed, let's move on to the defensive slots next. There are two types of equipment for this slot and this will vary based on character. You will either get what I like to call a shield, which gives you a block chance, or a stat boosting item. For the shield, we follow the same principles as the crit item. Higher chance to block nets a lower block amount and vice versa. Simply put, always go for the higher block chance. You should never be relying on a block to get you through battle. It should be considered a bonus. Remember that you can swap this around characters depending on who you are using for a specific battle, since this is such an interchangeable item. Generally, the shield is among the worst investments you can make for equipment, and you should not be upgrading your shields. The next defensive item is the stat boosting item. There are two types here. You have the pauldron type, which gives you both bonus armor and health, or the Greaves type, which only gives you bonus armor. Generally, the pauldron is the better type. Health is health, and the more you have, the less you die. Abilities and enemy piercing damage can reduce or negate the effect of armor, reducing its overall value. Additionally, you can heal health, but you can't do the same for armor. There are some special considerations though. Armor is really good against low pierce attacks, especially when you have specific traits like Gravis armor. To remind ourselves, Gravis Armor is a character trait that requires your damage to go through armor a second time. Therefore, maximizing your armor there is almost doubly useful. On screen, you can see the screenshot on the right that shows with a high enough armor, the Screamer Killer's physical melee attacks are reduced all the way to 1 when attacking Bellator's Gravis Armor. There is also a quick nod here to the Necron faction and their Living Metal trait. They heal themselves 10% max health each turn, as well as having healing abilities for Aleph Null and Makotep. There is clear incentive for you to give these guys the health item for their defensive slot. The takeaways here are listed on screen. Don't bother upgrading your shield. If your character has a stat item, then health is better than armor in the majority of cases. Again, as was the case for the weapons, the value of these stat changes decreases as you power your characters through gear tiers. Item impact is pretty negligible at the mid to end game. The last slot is the booster slot. It can be either crit or block. I'm largely going to gloss over this because the yield for these items is so poor compared to upgrading either the weapon or the shield, and I think that's something that you should not be doing. Let's wrap this up with a few final points. Remember that you can move items around. There is no reason for you to be upgrading or buying 40 pieces of legendary gear. Just move them around prior to battle. Never ascend your items between rarity. You'll lose a lot of salvage and it's better off just waiting until you find the necessary item rarity organically. As the game progresses, the item impact becomes smaller. For example, the level 50 Kalgar passive contributes roughly 8 times more than a legendary gun for Bellator. However, if you're somebody who's looking to squeeze the most out of your roster, then going back to Nimak's table will tell you the best item to equip for any given character. Hopefully, items and item strength is something that Snowprint can look at in coming versions of the game, because I think, as I've said, the scaling on these items is really poor towards the end of the game. 
It wouldn't be a Nandi video without another plea to buff Shadow Sun, who is the weakest legendary character in the game. Snowprint, please consider adding this to your list after working on those that desperately need it more. Orcs, I'm looking at you. Finally, the giveaway. I think a lot of people are sleeping on just how good the Tyrant Guard is. Reducing damage by up to a third is insanely good value, and I think he's among the most valuable Xenos for legendary events. He also meets a lot of unique traits like big target, physical, and piercing damage. I'm giving him away today as one of only two characters with a double defensive item, improving on his already tanky stats to make him one of the most durable characters in the game. Leave a comment below to be in for a chance to win one of six prizes, either one of three full character unlocks or three character shard giveaways. I'll draw the winner by December 21st as a little early Christmas treat for whoever wins. A quick shout out too to Jace for the inspiration for the star-based stats model on screen. That's all I've got for today, a bit of a longer video but I think necessary to do the justice to the topic. I have to give a massive shout out to Tawan who's been an invaluable asset to me and whom I don't thank enough for all the input he has on my videos. I've included his referral code here on screen. If you enter it you'll earn 100 blackstone and support him, which in turn supports me. It's single use though so choose who you support carefully. Finally, if you're interested in joining the Eye of Terror cluster and playing with analytical and successful players like Nimak, feel free to pop by our Discord via video description link. Bye for now. Do do dee. It's Nandi.